Hi everyone, Suzette Martinez Valderas here. Thanks for tuning in. Um, pardon my late start. I needed to um, plug in my computer um, because I don't want to die on you in the middle of what is going to be a very fun, exciting, and informative conversation. Uh, I'm going to be have I'm going to have um, congressional candidate Ted Howes on in just a few minutes. But I hope that um, I'm tuning in a lot this week on Facebook. And now my live streams are not only on Facebook, they're also on YouTube. So if you um, want to follow me on YouTube or if you want to revisit any of my um, live videos, please go to my YouTube channel, follow me as well. Um, I also hope that you were able to tune in yesterday. I was super fortunate to have had um, Gil Gonzalez on, and we were talking um, all things SBA, the Paycheck Protections Program, um, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, everything under the sun. So if you own a small business and you have been applying for these, you are in the process of applying, and you um, might want to take a look at that video, it has some really important tips and um, on paperwork, on what to do to ensure that um, you are doing everything that you can to bring in some much needed monies um, during this government shutdown. Um, I have actually spoken with quite a few people and um, that have received their confirmations and or their PPP funding, which is really good to hear because this is now, let's see, day 43 maybe day 44, I've literally lost track of count uh, or of, of the count here of, of the government shutdown and um, stay at home order or business shutdown, I should say, not government shutdown. Um, and it is affecting us, whether you're in the workforce or you're a small business owner. Um, it is so, it is unreal. And um, we are finding additional information and resources um, about how to help businesses. So please make sure that you are um, looking at that. Look at my Facebook page um, uh, if you can. So I'm really excited today to have, um, like I was mentioning, a congressional candidate, uh, a Republican congressional candidate, Ted Howes, that's going to visit with us. And we're going to talk a little bit about the 10th, California's 10th congressional district. We're going to talk about how we share in common kind of the unlikely Republican story, as well as how COVID-19 is affecting our, dis uh, our district, the most vulnerable in our district, and some kind of unique things that um, we have taken on during this pandemic. So let me bring on Ted. Hi, Suzette. How are you? Good. I'm great. Thank you so much for um, jumping on with me. Um, I'm excited to talk to you. First of all, congratulations on your big primary win. Um, I mean, you know this yourself. We won, you because I won too on, on, on March 3rd. And then we had about a week of what we thought was gonna be kind of a normal campaign life post-primary. <laughs> and then everything hit, which just, uh, tell me about your primary night. Tell me about your big primary win and what you've been doing. Sure. Well, I, as like you, I'm sure that feeling of having all that hard work come together, uh, you know, for me, it, it wasn't just about, you know, hey, wow, I won. I, I kind of sat and looked at the room in awe at all of the people who had volunteered for us, yeah. you know, volunteers, staff, all the long hours that they put in. And at the end of the night, that feeling for me was almost relief that, wow, we did it for them, right? Right. You know, you just it's kind you, of go ahead. You just have so many people that have done so much for you that you don't want to let them down. Right. So it, it really is a sense of relief. And then, like you said, a couple of days of being all jazzed up about excited on the next step, and then the rug was pulled out from under us. Yeah, I mean, you're completely right. I mean, I think if you've ever watched a campaign victory speech, even just one in your life, you always see candidates thanking their team or the volunteers. And until you're in that situation and you really, really, truly realize that it is a team effort, like you, we may be the face of a campaign, but that's, you know, 
practically it. There is a whole body of support from people who just want to get our state on the right track or our country on the right track. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. kudos to your volunteers. Cause so your races was one of the seven um, congressional districts that we lost in 2018. And um, thank you for stepping up to that plate. So your district specifically is a 10th congressional district. It's what's known as, you're going to tell me more about it in a minute, but the Central Valley. And I have a special place in my heart for the Central Valley. My Most of my family's from the Central Valley, from Bakersfield, um, work the fields. My dad, I joke that you can hardly um, tell that he wasn't born in Mexico because his accent is so good from working in the fields for so long. Um, what was it like growing up in the Central Valley on farms and ranches? And is it why you decided to become a veterinarian? Yeah, well, good question. First of all, we probably crossed paths somewhere because I grew up down south in the Bakersfield area when I was young. Family lived oh. in Chapter. My family farmed in uh -huh. Arvin. Uh, mm -hmm. We worked all around, uh, settled in Hanford, and then I wound up here in the Modesto area after college. For me, it's a love of agriculture. I loved farming. I loved animals. I knew I wasn't, you know, from the background where I was going to afford to buy a lot of land and farm. Mm -hmm. So I chose the path of getting involved in medicine and animals and uh, not looking back. It's just it's been the greatest career choice ever because now not only do I get to work with, you know, animals, which I love, I think that's my mm -hmm. first calling, but people who are just the salt of the earth and agriculture mm -hmm. and my clients are like family members to me. I've watched their children grow up and the next generation take over. And it's just, it's amazing. And, you know, we would talk about that unlikely background. It's why we've followed one another on social media for quite a long time now and i'm a huge fan of yours because we oh, have you. those odd background yeah. and i think for us you know you especially having the latino background myself the american indian background mm -hmm. we've come up through working hard and in the valley we're i like to think we're the future of the republican party right that new yeah. blood that is coming in with with a different perspective and different ideas and specifically kind of working class and I think I think we represent where we need to go to serve the people of this of this state. Yeah, you know what? I've been coining um, or using the word modern Republican because I like you. I came to the Republican Party for um, very different reasons, I think, than what people think Republicans are or what they believe or what they support. And, you know, me personally, um, I decided to be a Republican because of my upbringing, my my faith. My dad was a, is is a small business owner. He never graduated high school, but worked hard to provide for his family and open his own business. He is a true entrepreneur, entrepreneur, and I just saw his his struggle my entire life as a small business owner. Um, so I can definitely sympathize with what our small businesses owners are going through right now, yet alone what I've experienced my entire life as a small business owner, owner myself. Um, but you're right, we're, we're, we don't have that typical background. And one of the things I think that's most interesting for me and I connect with you on is that one of the reasons I decided to run for office is because um, one was the birth of my daughter. Um, two was my mother who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2018. She was diagnosed in, um, on May 9th of 2018, and or I found myself being her full-time caregiver. I was responsible for her advanced directive. Um, it, it was an end-of-life journey that I didn't expect to experience at my age, yet alone her age at 62, and it made me really realize how broken our healthcare system is, how expensive yeah. Yeah. it is, and that if you don't have somebody that is an annoying, strong voice like mine to advocate for you, um, then I don't know how those people get, get through it. And you, you have a similar story. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Well, you know, and people like you and I, we go through that and we tend to just, you know, work through it and try to do the best we can. But the healthcare system, most people don't understand, we inherently trust our doctors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they tell us one thing, we, we want to believe them and we want to 
take the word, what we lose track of in this country, we have an health insurance system behind us that's perhaps not doing the right thing. In the case of my late wife, you know, she started to show odd little health symptoms in 2010. They plagued her for a couple of years. We were working our way through the system. We had a doctor who was ordering testing. We had an insurance company that kept saying she was too young and too healthy to need the testing the doctor ordered. Then it was unfortunate after she passed away in 2013 that we learned she had a treatable heart condition. So, you know, it's just, it's devastating when we go through something like that. For me, it's given me perspective on the importance of healthcare in this country. And you can have the best health insurance in the world, but it doesn't mean you necessarily uh-huh. deliver good outcomes in that case. Now, for me, the the silver lining in the story is I never dreamed that the death of my first wife would save the life of my current wife. And that was as Laura and I started dating I started to recognize a lot of the same signs. I pushed her to get in. I became her loudest advocate. I, of course, annoyed her because she thought I was just, you know, putting the bad signs everywhere because of my experience. And lo and behold, we found out she had almost the identical heart condition. And she got tested and on medication and it's changed the quality of her life. So, the you know, to go through it the first time and kind of just sit down and take it, Versus yeah. the second time being a very vocal advocate for the person you love, completely different outcomes. And it was because of, of us, right? Not because yeah. of the doctors or the healthcare system. So I like to tell everybody on the campaign trail, I'm the one Republican who healthcare is my biggest goal mm-hmm. to solve in this country. It needs to become not only affordable and available to all Americans, but it has to be effective with quality outcomes. Right. Also. So that's kind of the background story and where we come. And I, I really hope to make a huge difference, you know, and part of that for me is for my late wife. Uh, well, thank you for doing that because we need to do it both at our national level and both at our state level, which is one of my my commitments to to make our system better and work for every Californian in California. And you need to do that on the national level. Um, and then, so what, can you tell me a little bit, because what's interesting is that you're also a veterinarian. So you probably know a little bit more about, you know, the human body and which is why <laughs> you probably have been a great advocate, but you probably know a little bit more about even COVID-19 um, because I think you also have a specific specialty in herd immunity, like literally herd immunity, right? Like yes, people are, are herd too. But um, why why did you choose to specialize in, in herd immunity? Well, because uh, again, I like working outdoors. I'm not an indoor kind of guy. I'm a football coach too because I like being outside. Uh, and real fast, it's something we share is is education and working with kids. I know early childhood mm-hmm. education is a big thing for you. For me, I've coached youth and high school athletics for decades. My wife is a Catholic school teacher. So I like to think, you know, you get them young, I'll get them older. And, uh, but, we have, but we have a passion for the youth in our community. Lies in, in basically large herd medicine. I work with large, a lot of large dairy herds. And uh, so for us, the epidemiology of herd health is an everyday concept. You know, how we approach diseases that come through herds, how we either, you know, let the disease work its way through and then treat and firm individuals, or we choose to vaccinate based on the availability of a vaccine, how we make those economic decisions to do that. So, you know, I watched COVID with a very keen eye. And you may not know, I was a firefighter and EMT for seven years also. So I have a human health background. Yeah, I have a human health background as well as a veterinary background. So for me, I watch the medicine. I I try to read as much as I can every day. And, you know, I'm I'm one of these firm believers that we need to get our economy reopened. It's time to get back to work. And there's some steps we need to take to protect people. This is obviously a horrendous disease. And we need to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And I talk with my human doctor friends a lot about, you know, what we should be doing is stay in place or quarantine orders for our, you know, uh, for our elderly community. Right. And if we're going to test, our first testing should be healthcare workers coming and going from those right. facilities to protect them. But for those of us who are young and healthy and our immune systems are solid, 
you know, we're better to get out and let this let this work its course through us and develop, you know, that herd immunity that ultimately protects everybody, even the most vulnerable in society. Right. And Ted, a little. So I actually saw a map this morning about um, with California's map of um, confirmed COVID cases. And it's very interesting that you would expect in L.A. it's pretty dark and, you know, um, the Bay Area, it's pretty dark shade. Yeah, sure. The shade indicating there was between 10 and 100,000 and then uh, larger than that. And some areas in California and counties, there's no cases. I mean, very mm-hmm. few. Um, but doesn't that also kind of say that there's less of a risk for certain maybe I don't know if it's counties and this should be like a case by case county or just a methodical opening, but qu- as quickly as po- possible. I'm, 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 I could be completely wrong. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Listen, disease passage is all about population densities, right? Why has New York been hit so hard? It's been hit so hard because the number of people who pack into mass transit, you know, riding the subways together, riding buses together, so many people living per apartment building. We don't have that in the Central Valley for the most case. You look at Stanislaus and San Joaquin counties, our our district specifically, you know, there's only a population of about 550,000 people. You know, that's a couple of counties in Southern California or in the Bay Area. So it's just when you cram people on top of each other in, in urban densities, you're going to pass diseases faster. You know, there are a lot of Northern count, California counties and Eastern Mountain counties that per, could probably open right away with no, you know, no increased incidence of disease whatsoever. So I, I've been talking with a lot of people in my staff. One of the ideas I've floated is, listen, we need to respect everybody who's fearful of catching this disease mm-hmm. and we need to get them some options. You know, one of the things that we could look at and open up tomorrow is let's say that we allowed grocery stores, pharmacies, businesses to say, you know, Tuesday and Thursday are everybody has to wear mask and glove days. Okay. If you can, right. Every other day is business as usual and we'll clean in between business days. And that way people who are fearful and have health problems, they can go out and do what they need to do on certain days of the week and they can choose to shelter in place otherwise there there are a lot of options out there the the deal is is getting our leaders to listen to those of us with some medical background and experience to do this paper well and start listening and planning for it now right because we close practically overnight at least that's what it felt like right one day your kids were in school and the next day they were not going to school and you were having to learn zoom lessons with your child Um, (laughs) and the next day you know we, we were closed and what I so I want to get into a little bit about the supply chain and there is some indications that some of it is breaking down. And I know that's being talked about by our president right now, um, but I noticed it early on. Um, I have a small child care, which you're aware of, and um, we decided to open. We were closed for two weeks. There was some clarity that was given um, from the state that we were an essential business. So we reopened. But with the caveat that we were going to only be serving um, our essential workforce and children that needed services. So high risk children. And, you know, so we reopened, but we had a multitude of new guidelines that we had to follow rightfully. So, and we're doing them to keep children safe, social distancing. Yes. You can social distance with a toddler. It's very hard, but it can be done. Um, And then we're cleaning a lot, right? So disinfectant wipes, Um, We're using hand sanitizer, all of these supplies that are now impossible to find. Yeah. And we started Operation Child Care, which you and I will get into that in a second. But we have to think about that, too, right? Because if we reopen and there's more people that need these types of supplies, we we are government has to start preparing for that now. And private industry is 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 really the only um, industry that can deliver that for us. Absolutely. So, I apologize. It's windy oh, here today. I'm dry, so <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Um, so, have you seen that in your community? Is that? Can you tell me a little bit about COVID nineteen in your community? How it's affecting your local business, um, and some of the issues that you've identified. Yeah. Well, our biggest issues, I think, are just like a lot of places, right? When this initial shutdown occurred, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. So we had a, we just had a rush on everything, right? 
hoarders were the bane of everyone's existence. I still don't understand why the run on toilet paper, right? <laughs> you know, I saw people early on walk out of stores with enough for a family for five years. I guess they don't know what their right. usage is. But this is why, you know, we talk about what we're doing. Our Operation Compassion was born out of the fact that I was in a local Rayleigh store early on because my kids had been told to go home from college, right? You're not welcome here anymore. Go home. Yeah. And so, you know, campaign trail, we had just come through the primary. There was no food at home because we <laughs> eat out every single night, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly I start getting calls, hey dad, we're coming home. So I looked around and thought, geez, I better go to the store because if we're all going to be locked down, there's no food here. And the first day in Arelis in Turlock, you know, I'm walking through the aisles and there was an elderly lady that was just visibly upset. And I stopped and I asked her, I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, I'm on a fixed income and everybody's bought all of the cheapest yeah. options of the foods. She said, I don't know how I'm going to make it through the month. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say cheap, <laughs> but I'm miserly with the family budget. And I start looking and I'm realizing, oh my goodness, she's right. The spaghetti that's left on the shelves is, are all gluten-free options at yeah. seven or eight bucks a package. It's not your, you know, your typical $2 spaghetti that you buy. And it really struck me. I came back and, and caught my staff the next morning and I said, listen, guys, I think it's going to be tough to campaign during this. Yeah. You're going to get, a, you're not going to be very well liked if you're trying to and we decided to keep all of our campaign staff on, but shift our mission to a philanthropic mission. And that's how Operation Compassion was born. And we're fortunate to have partnered with so many entities in the communities, local Christian schools and other candidates and the mayors. You know, we have 11 mayors in our district that have endorsed wow. my congressional run. And we've partnered with many of them to do, you know, boxed food giveaways in their communities. So that that's just been great. The, now, now we have other supply chain worries, which, you know, yeah. are us, and it's the ripple effects of what's going on in the economy. And as somebody who works in agriculture, that truly concerns me. So I think the need is just going to continue to grow for those of us who are out trying to service our communities. And how have you, from an operational perspective, because we just started Operation Child Care um, about a week and a half ago, and we're collecting um, the, the donations that the items that I mentioned earlier, um, and we're donate, We're working with the California Child Care Resource Center to disseminate those to providers that are open because what is unique in this situation is not all providers are open, which yeah. puts a strain on access to child care services for our essential workers, right? Which is very, 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 very important. And it initially I was like, how are we going to identify these people? Oh, well, duh, let's call Child Care Resource Center. How are you identifying um, the people in need, are they coming to you? Um, how is that working? Yeah, well, yeah. it's it's really truly been a community collaborative. So what began with us for just delivering, you know, six or seven care packages in a day yeah. or two to some people who were really in need, we, we I started posting it, Facebook Lives saying, hey, you know, we're trying to match people in need with people who have excess supplies. If you, you know, if you're one of the people who've hoarded, <laughs> please, you know, consider right. giving some back to other people. And we were inundated over a couple of days with people coming to our campaign office and, and doing the right thing and just donating a bunch of stuff. And so we started filling more and more bags. Then we had more food than we could give away. So we started calling people. We literally just started calling seniors in our community asking, hey, are you okay? Is there anything you need? If they said they were great, we left a number and said, well, contact us if that changes. But we found the need was there. Once that got out, that we were trying to help people in our community and we were specifically focusing on seniors and disabled veterans, then we started right. getting calls from people with families. Yeah. Hey, husband and I have both lost our jobs. We have five kids at home and no money. Uh, is, is there anything you can do? People calling us saying we're on COVID lockdown yeah. and nobody to shop for us. Can you help? And we, we turned nobody away. We right. took everything as a, I tell my staff that it was training for being in a congressional office. When somebody calls for a problem, we're going to find mm -hmm. a way to solve it. We're, we're, right. we're going to do that job. And from there, it just ballooned. So my recommendation would be, you know, start to put some, Facebook live videos out there asking people, hey, 
uh, we're trying to match need with demand, you'll be surprised how fast people people come to you. So don't be afraid to pass a phone number out. Mine's out there for everybody. So I get a lot of phone calls. Yeah, mine can be found. I don't think I've actually given my number out on Facebook Live. I'll think about that a little bit, but it's out there. If you guys really want it, it's out there. You can find <laughs> it. <laughs> so um, where can people donate now? Well, now they, they two options for us. They can either call us if they have a large donation and we'll go pick it up and bring it back in or they can bring it right to our campaign office, drop it off at the front door and we'll bring it in and, and make sure we get it dispensed. Our biggest logistical thing is we don't want a ton of people in our campaign office, okay. right? We want we want people who come to donate things to leave it at the door, we'll bring it in, process it. First of all, we're pretty sure our entire staff had COVID back in February, pre-primary. It went through us, you know, just like a ton of bricks right, right before the primary. So. We've all been together for six months. We, you know, we've got every bug under the sun. Our little herd is immune. So, you know, we're comfortable. We don't want other people coming in and out. So we try to really keep that separation, but we'll pick it up or they can drop it off. Either way, we do have a common number out there. And, you know, we get a lot of calls every day, both for drop offs and for people in need. And you know what I love about both in Operation Child Care and Operation Com compassion is that it is so typical conservative, right? This is what we do. We identify problems and we do our best as citizens and as community leaders to bring resources and resources to individuals and peoples. We're not relying on the government, we're not yelling at the government, hey, you got to do this. We're making it happen within our own communities. So I, I love that both you and I get to switch that narrative, right? Like Operation Compassion, Republicans are the most compassionate people I've ever met. Yeah, well, and, it's, and I think part of the reason it reaches home with us is because we're business owners, right? Mm -hmm. It's that business owner mentality. I, I care for my employees, right? They're, they're family to me. Mm -hmm. I make sure my employees are taken care of before myself. I worry about them. It, so we already have that mentality. So right. something like this happens, we step up, we get involved and we try to take care of our community around us. For myself, it's been one of the most humbling and fulfilling experiences of our life. Again, my wife's a Catholic school teacher. She's very involved in the faith based community. The, mm -hmm. This is what we do as you know, people who love our community and love our neighbors and to see so many in need. Uh, we, we do give you know, we did, we gave away 4,000 loaves of bread in three days. Wow. And the people coming through line for bread that were just bawling their eyes out yeah. for, for bread. But to yeah. me, at the end of those three days, uh, you know, sitting at home with my wife afterwards, I said, I never would have dreamed I'd have seen this in my life. Yeah. That giving right. people bread would have been worthy of seeing them cry. But from there, it just lit a fire under us to do even more. So, yeah it's going to be difficult for us to get back to campaigning when it opens up. <laughs> we're going to have to get back to real work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. We're, we're going to need to start to campaign yeah. again at some point when the world opens up. And I know in my heart, the need's not going to end yeah. with, with us opening back up. So that's going to be a tough transition. We're trying to figure right. out how to handle that. Right. Well, take comfort in knowing that you getting into office is a, is, is a, a need, right? We need to get our country back on the right track. And by having you in office, by flipping that seat and having a representative, just like in my community that represents our community's voice and values, that's a true need too. And that will come, that will come over the summer. Yeah. Um, where can people find out more information about your campaign, about you um, today? Well, it's, my, it's pretty easy. It's my name, tedhouse.com. That's our website, easy to find me, easy to find out the background history. I think all of us have websites anymore that are pretty much almost our names. So, <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, we'd love anybody who's willing to support us to come and find out that information and hopefully support us. And I would like to ask my supporters in California 10th to support you also, because 
you know, like I said, I've been a fan for a long time. Our values are very much aligned. I think you would be a great voice in Sacramento. We know we need good common sense voices in Sacramento. So, you know, for my followers, as you're watching this on Facebook, I'm going to ask you to go out and find Suzette's web page. And also if you can spare five dollars ten dollars twenty five and chip yeah. in to help her it would be greatly appreciated thank you so much we definitely need a balance in sacramento which is um, why i'm running i do see that we have one question so i'm going to take one question and i'm going to let you back to helping out your community so joe has is has asked on from facebook what is it like to see such a need in the community with the whole COVID-19 pandemic? And how have your operations developed to help meet those needs? So we kind of answered that, but um, just recap for him real quick. Well, to see so much need has just really been, has been humbling. I mean, you, you, you always know there's needy people in your community, right? And you have the ability through, through, churches and different organizations to help people, but to see mass need is, it just changes the whole yeah. ball game. And so for us, we just, we found a way to get involved. It's continued to ramp up day by day. We've been, you know, very fortunate to draw more and more community members in every day to help us and leaders. We have found, at least in our area, we have a lot of true leaders who have been willing to step up and help in this effort so we're just going to keep helping people and until we you know kind of transition out and then we're hoping we can find somebody to pick that mantle up for us and we really have we're blessed to have you know turlock christian schools in our area my hometown of turlock that have really dived into helping us and you know we think that once we move on to campaigning again we'll have them pick up the mantle of helping with the need in the district well, thank you so much. I look forward to connecting again soon um, and good luck with the rest of your mission there. I know your community community is appreciative of it just like mine. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I um, hope you enjoyed meeting Ted Howes. Isn't he amazing? Um, he's just awesome. And I really respect what he's doing and, and his community truly needs a voice. Um, in Washington, um, which is Ted's. Uh, just to recap a little bit about Operation Child Care, please, if you can volunteer time, we do need people to make some phone calls to request donations, um, request bulk donations. So please go to my website at suzettevelladares.com to sign up to volunteer. You can volunteer from home. Um, if you want to make pickups with us, you can also volunteer or, or um, volunteer um, or register to volunteer to make pickups as well. Go to my website at SuzetteValiers.com, guys. We need your help. Our essential workforce needs your help um, to make sure they are taking care of our family and our friends and neighbors in, that are sick with COVID-19 right now while child care providers are taking care of the essential workforce's children. So thanks for tuning in. Talk to you soon.